Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our series of interviews with subject matter experts, people who are making a difference in the world, working with families, students, parents, educators, businessmen. And today I have with me a very special guest, Dave Crenshaw. And I met him at a recent conference in which he presented. I was very impressed with what he had to say. So I asked him to join me today as we talk about some of the issues of or topics of managing time and especially the myth of multitasking. So welcome, Dave. Thanks, Cindy. So glad to be here. So you understand you are a productive leadership author and speaker. What does that mean? Yeah. So first of all, uh, I have to define leadership because I think a lot of people um, don't understand that they can and are a leader. They can be and they are a leader. And my perspective is that every single person can be a leader if they choose to be so. It's not a matter of title. A leader is someone who, who inspires others to change and to grow. And so productive leaders are people who get the results that they want by helping other people grow. Um, you know, as opposed to just, let's just say a manager, right? A manager gets results through other people. But leadership is about that, that action of helping others also get their result and helping others also become better and better each day. So parents are leaders. Even students can be leaders of their fellow students uh, and leaders of their class. They're, everyone can have that opportunity, but first you have to make that choice. And then the productive side of it is that you're doing it in the most efficient way possible. I think that's a very important point for us, is especially from an education or counseling perspective to think about, because we do talk to our students about, well, what does it take to be a leader? And oftentimes people think of it as, well, I'm the one that's in the front, I'm making all the decisions, but the key thing is being able to help others to be who they are and what they can be. Exactly, and, and it is independent of a title. So you wrote this book called The Myth of Multitasking. What prompted you to write that book? Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, you have to understand my, my background, which is that um, I, uh, prior to doing this, I was jumping around from career to career. I was extremely disorganized. I mean, my, my office is looking pretty good right now. But if you'd seen it, 10, 12 years ago, well, let's see, Myth of Multitasking came out 10 years, so we'll say 13 years ago. If you've seen it 13 years ago, you would be embarrassed to interview me because <laughs> you would see piles of paper everywhere and stuff stuffed into cubbies and just spilling out onto the, the floor, but, but um, and it was, it was a pattern that was happening throughout my life, and, and I heard two words that made me realize I needed to change, and the two words were, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and, and, and when I heard those, I thought, my gosh, I can't continue to operate like this. I have to be someone, you know, I'm going to be uh, helping provide for a life and becoming an example for this life. And so I, I went and uh, got some, a couple of tests done. And the, the psychologist that I was working with, he just kind of, he kind of shook his head after looking at the text and he said, has anyone ever talked to you about ADHD? And I, I said, well, I don't think that's me. And he said, no, you are, and this is word for word where he said, you are freaking off the charts, ADHD. If there were a fifth standard deviation, you'd be in it. Um, and so, so that's A number one, is that I had a problem with attention and with focus and with being able to, to master the idea of working on one thing at a time and finishing it before I move to the next thing. Second of all, I was a, uh, a business coach, in particular working with small business owners, with entrepreneurs. As a group, the men and women who own businesses are some of the most disorganized people in the world. And part of it is because their job responsibility makes them so. They don't have one job title. Right. Right? They're not just a teacher. They're a manager, salesperson, HR, janitor. You know, they're doing manufacturing. They're doing everything. And so that need to constantly switch from task to task to task puts them in a situation where they think they're supposed to multitask all the time. Mm -hmm. And so in working with them and in working with me uh, and just helping myself overcome my issues, I discovered a system that was simplified 
and I discovered that the root cause of the reason why most people now feel that they do not have enough time and the reason why they're so stressed out is because we are addicted to the myth of multitasking as a, a society. So what is, why is that a myth? Why, why do we think we can do it, especially women especially think they are, can do it well, and that we can't? So explain that. Yeah, well, first of all, in general, uh, the human mind is only able to process and focus on one active task at a time. Uh, and when I say active, I mean something that requires your attention. For instance, having this conversation, you and I, if I were trying to answer email while I was trying to have this conversation with you, Cindy, I would be, I'd be switching rapidly back and forth. And then the book, The Myth of Multitasking, came out in 2008. And there's a thick biography in the back that shows people, you know, all of the research. There's been tons more research, hundreds of more studies done since that book came out. And what they all substantiate is that the brain is limited. It, it must focus on one attention acquiring, requiring task at a time. So when people think they're multitasking, most often what they're doing is they're really switch tasking. And that's what I, what I add in the book is, is saying, look, the definition of the word multitasking in and of itself is incorrect. You are either switch tasking, which is requiring multiple, you know, you're trying to jump back and forth between tasks, or you are background tasking where you're doing one thing and something mindless or mundane or automatic occurs in the background. So let's use this example again, you and I having a conversation. If I started my printer here in my office, my laser jet printer, and told it to print 100 copies of something, that's background tasking. That's not requiring my attention. Mm -hmm. but, but the problem is when most people say I'm good at multitasking, what they're really referring to is switch tasking. And that will always cause things to take longer. You'll make more mistakes and you'll increase your stress levels when you do that. So from a student perspective, you know, thinking about how this applies in a student's day. You know, they've mm -hmm. got several periods. They're doing sports. They're doing, um, have homework at the end. They've got AP English. What kind of tips or recommendations do you have for students in terms of how to manage that heavy load um, without having to buy into the myth of multitasking? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the first thing is to be aware of where you are and focus where you are in the moment. Because um, I can, you know, I can talk about other strategies, but it begins with focus in the classroom. I need to pay attention to what's happening. And that right there is already a problem, isn't it? So many students are, are multitasking, their attention's all over the place, they're distracted, they're not paying attention. So let's say that I'm in a class, because I know that here's the question, the argument, well, what if I'm in a class and the teacher's boring, right? So what I need to do is find ways to make it interesting. One way to do that is I can increase my level of engagement with what's happening. I'm a big fan of something called sketch noting. I don't know if you've heard of this. Mm -mm. Um, this is something that we even helped my son do. My son's 12 now, but even in elementary school, he had a really hard time paying attention. And what sketch noting says, and there's, there are great authors about it, you can Google it, um, is that w rather than taking notes, you draw pictures. But you're not drawing pictures, just random pictures. You're drawing pictures about what's happening. Mm -hmm. So if it, I'm trying to, you know, if someone's talking about what happened in history, for instance, I want to start drawing pictures of the event that they're describing in history. So what it's doing is it's, it's I'm actually doubling down in my investment in this classroom and I'm doing more to pay attention, making it more interesting for myself. Um, the other thing to do is we could background task effectively. I'm also a fan of, of fidgeting appropriately, uh, meaning appropriately means that it's out of sight and it's quiet and it's mindless. So I'm not talking about taking those stupid fidget spinners and spinning them like this. You do that, you're already breaking all three rules, right? <laughs> it's in front of everybody, it's noisy, and it's requiring your attention. I'm talking about, you know, I've got, I've got one right here. 
I uh, hadn't planned on it, but so I've got I've got this little you know little snake thing. So if I'm I have a horrible time, I'm one of the worst listeners in the world. So if I'm in a situation where I know I'm going to have to listen for a while, I put this in my lap and I just start doing this, right? I'm just playing with it. This is background tasking. I'm not removing my attention, but it's sort of you know it's sort of a, a soothing uh, activity to help me stay focused and stay engaged in a situation where it's going to be really difficult for me to do that. So, I don't know. That's that's a start. I could I could keep going. Uh, how far do you want me to go here? <laughs> um, give me one more. What what would be the third thing you would? Okay. So the next thing I would talk about is is um, what's happening um, between or after your classes. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to gather actions, and I talk about this in my course, Time Management Fundamentals, uh, which is on LinkedIn Learning. And do you mind if I share a link to that? No, I, that's one of my questions at the end. Is how okay, so I'll share it now. More. We can share it at the end. But it's davecrenshaw.com forward slash time. That's where you can get 30 days free access to my time management fundamentals class. And I've had lots of people, lots of students, lots of teachers come to me, tell me this, this class has changed their world. Um, so so um, one of the principles that I talk about is, is you want to gather actions. If you keep things in your mind, like for instance, the teacher says, here's an assignment that I need to do, and you go, okay, I'm going to do that assignment, and your hands don't move, and you don't put anything else, I can guarantee you, you're going to fail. Or I can say with high degree of accuracy, 60% of the time or so, you are not going to follow through on that. Right. Instead, you need to have one clear gathering point. For instance, one notepad. Or on my phone, I use um, the OneNote app. Mm -hmm. and I can just um, you know, go to that app right here, and I can push the, you know, make a note to myself, and then I can write down what the assignment was that the teacher gave to me. Now I've got it out of my mind, and then I just need to have a time where I go through all those notes, and I'm looking for action items. That's what I encourage people to do. And that's another tip, too, is I encourage people when they're in classes, when they're in lectures, when they're in conferences, whatever it is, don't take notes. Take actions. And what that means is you're listening for things that you're telling yourself, I need to do that. I need to do something with that. I need to look that up. That's the kind of stuff you want to be taking notes on. Because odds are, most everything else, you can read it again in the book. Just mm -hmm. writing it down is not necessarily a virtue or helping you learn better. That makes, that makes total sense. Um, I've been involved with AVID. I don't know if you're familiar with that. but I'm not. <clears throat> it's an outreach program. They have it um, throughout the U.S. I know there's some AVID programs in Utah, and we teach students how to take Cornell notes and keep a calendar and, you know, those kinds of things. But being able to find ways where you can be engaged in your learning, and a lot of times it is having the um, something to do doodling. I love the idea of the sketch noting, so we'll, we'll look that up. So I'm wondering, okay. one of the things that you said prompted my, my thought about the role of cell phones. You know, everybody is always coming into a classroom in between, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's got their cell phones out. So what do you see as the, like, are they supposed to put their cell phones away? What, what are your recommendations? What have you found effective in terms of the role of cell phones in being productive and engaged? Yeah. So first of all, let me just, let's back up and talk about a general principle that I truly, truly believe in. Because you're talking to a, a technology geek, all right? I love technology, and, and a lot of times people will say, oh, this technology is making us multitask. It's making us not have focus, and that's, that's complete bunk. Technology is not the problem. The improper use of technology is the problem. So let's take your example of going into a classroom and the cell phones are out. Personally, I, unless the teacher is, is actively somebody who's saying, let's look this up together, let's research this together, I believe that all phones should go into airplane mode. And that is going to prevent you from having that tendency to go off and wander into weird places and because, you know, that your stuff's going to pop in your head. Oh, I wonder what someone just did on Instagram. I wonder how many likes I just got on that post, right? Just because right, it popped right. in your head doesn't mean you need to do anything about it right now. Right. In fact, if it's that important, 
then make a note to yourself to do it later. Okay? But I do believe that the, 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 the device is very valuable. It's valuable for note-taking. It's valuable for, for getting those gathering things that I talked about, getting those and putting them into an appropriate place. Um, it's, it's, it's appropriate for, for sketch noting and that sort of thing. It's, it's a question of establishing the boundaries. And so even just stepping away from the students for a second, I think the teachers should be very clear about what the boundaries are. You know, if we're going to have devices, okay, that's fine. So what can we do with the devices and what can't we do with the devices? Can we look up something that's related to what's happening, right? Can we um, um, do an online poll that the teacher's doing? But perhaps we say we're not going to use it for social media and we're not going to use it for random internet searches and we're certainly not going to use it to play Fortnite in our lap while the teacher's trying to teach. That's the kind of stuff that, uh, it's boundaries. It, it all comes back to boundaries. And people think that boundaries hurt them, but in fact, boundaries set you free and help you be more focused. I think that's a really good point. And I think that's something we need to remember as um, counselors and educators ourselves too. Um, lots of times we find it easier to set boundaries for our students, but what about for ourselves? And this yeah. my last question is, is, you know, do you have any tips or advice for professionals and how to find balance in their lives? You know, we all have more demands, more things than we can possibly do in a day, I'm sure. Yeah. So how do you find balance? It begins with the line in the sand or the finish line, as I like to call it. The finish line, if you think about what a race is, when I start a race, how do you know someone wins? Well, it's when they cross the finish line and who crosses the finish line first. What I see a lot in a professional context is people have no finish line. They start the day working hard, but then they don't know when the end of the day is. And when you do that, that actually perpetuates multitasking. It perpetuates a lack of focus. Why? Because time abhors a vacuum. We've heard that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, time abhors a vacuum. If I give myself permission to work as long as it takes to get the job done, guess what happens? I will fill in that space. But if I create a limit, if I say I'm only going to work until 5 o'clock, and personally, my line in the sand is 4 p.m. So today, I'm not going to be working after 4 p.m. What, what does that do to my work day? It puts me in a position where I am forced to analyze the work that I'm doing and the efficiency of the work that I'm doing. I have to learn how to delegate more, pro more effectively. I have, to, I have to learn how to say no to things. That's a big skill that we all need to learn is to learn how to say no. I need to learn how to be more efficient in my desk. Little things start to matter when I create that line in the sand, the mouse I use, the keyboard they use, the, the monitor they use, all these things have an influence in how effective I am. But if I allow myself to work as long as it takes with no boundary line whatsoever, I am never going to make any of those changes. I'm just going to continue to spin in circles and perpetuate the same mistakes over and over and over. That is very true. That is very profound. And I, so basically, it sounds like it starts with us. Um, and it goes back to that boundaries and setting our own boundaries so that we can be more um, effective and efficient and, and prioritize because sometimes we're doing things that really may not matter, right? Right. Well, or they matter, but they don't matter most. Mm -hmm. They're not the things that are most valuable. That's, that's my definition of focus is the strategic allocation of things towards things that, that are of highest value. Whereas chaos is the haphazard allocation of, of time toward things of variable value. The, we're, we're, in both situations, we're allocating time. In both situations, we're working. But in one situation, we're saying, you know what? Of all the things that I could be doing, talking to Cindy right now on this video is most valuable. For me, why? Because lots of people are going to see it. This 20-minute this investment is really worth 10, 20, who knows how many hours, right? Right. Instead of saying yes to every invitation that comes right. in, mm -hmm. right? we have to make choices and we have to say no far more than we say yes. 
And that is def definitely a difficult um, talent or skill to learn. So and I noticed you have some videos and things on that. So where, and you mentioned LinkedIn learning, where can we go to, to learn more? Um, I know I've already bought and downloaded your book. I haven't finished reading it yet, but. Thank you. Um, so where can people go to learn more? So, um, you know, my, my website is DaveCrenshaw.com, Crenshaw spelled with a C. Um, and I've got lots of free resources there. I, you can join th uh, tens of thousands of people who are getting weekly uh, productive, productive leadership tips from me. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, if you go to DaveCrenshaw.com forward slash time, that will send you to a special link on LinkedIn Learning where you'll, you can get 30 days free access. So, you know, you'll, you, you, we'll ask you for a credit card, but you can cancel at 29 days if you want to, but you'll get access to time management fundamentals. That's the A number one course I would recommend anyone to go through to get in control of their time. Uh, and then you'll also have access to other things like, I, you know, I've got a course on improving your focus, and they've got 10,000 plus courses on other topics as well. Well, thank you very much, and we do appreciate you taking the time today to share these tips and um, insights with us, and it's been very interesting to learn about your journey as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy.